this church is made up of diverse people, diverse uh, age groups, diverse races, diverse ethnic groups, diverse economic backgrounds, diverse politics, diverse politics. We'll, we might get into that a little bit today because I'm not a politician and I don't take a political uh, point of view. I take a biblical point of view, which lines me up sometimes with one party and sometimes with another. And, you know, I think that we have to live above the political system, not under it. I think we need to live above this world system, not under this world system. The Bible says, seek the things above where Christ is seated. Do not seek the th earthly things. Do not submit yourself to the worldly things. Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. He said, but submit yourself to heavenly things. Submit yourself to the grace of God. Submit yourself to the word of God, to the goodness of God. You see, we have a king. His name is Jesus. It's not about who's the president. It's not about if it's your political party or not your political party. There are things that Democrats do that are wrong. There are things that Republicans do that are wrong. We don't need to side with a political party. We need to side with the truth. We need to side with the word of God. We need to side with the life of God. You know, we had a Democrat the, uh, just the other day that that uh, was, that that had racist comments from his yearbook. And, and then we have Republicans that do that, that do things like that. And we have Democrats that do things like that. So racism is not found in a political party. Racism is found in a heart that is not surrendered to the truth and surrendered to Jesus. Amen. Amen. Abortion at nine months pregnant is not a political position. It is a lack of knowledge about the value of human life. It has nothing to do with being a Democrat or being a Republican. I. I encourage you if you're if you are of the if you are if you side with the Democrat. First of all, don't anybody leave over this because these are not political statements. These are statements about life. Amen. If you side with the Democrat Party when you when you make your votes, go for it. I'm a fan of yours. I see a lot of people that I can tell they're liberal political position on Facebook and social media. And I can tell other people's conservative position and I don't block them. I don't block either one because then I'm blocking half of y'all. <laughs> but you know what I block? Hate. You know what I block? Intolerance for the other point of view. But there is no other point of view to some things, and that's where we need to live above politics. You know, there is no doctor in this world today. There is no. Um, there, there, there is no veterinarian in this world today that would kill a puppy Amen. in its mother's womb right. when it's just about to be born. Right. That might offend you, but if it offends you, it's because you don't value life. Right. You value ideology and politics higher than life. Don't be a blind letting the blind lead the blind. Don't follow. Uh, 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 some, don't follow somebody because that's your political party. You follow the truth. The truth makes you free. There is truth among the Republicans. There is truth among the Democrats. There are some truths among liberals and there are some lies and there are some truths among conservatives and there are some lies. You have to you have to be a truth seeker, not a political party seeker. I ran into. The other day, I, I mean, I'm, I, 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 this isn't what I want to get into and we haven't you know, started recording yet, hopefully. Uh, but. Um, <laughs> I ran into this political leader uh, a, a few days ago, like the highest ranking political one of the highest ranking political leaders of the last 25 years. And I went up to him and I just said, I said, hey, man, nice to meet you. I've, I've known about you and followed your work for, you know, just, know, you know, watched you over the years. Don't agree with everything that you do. But um, but I just wanted to come and say hi. And he's like, oh, hi. And, he, you know, and, and I said, well, um, do you think we're ever going to get some bipartisanship in this country? And he looked at me and he said, why would you want that? He said, why would you want that? I said, because I want I want to see our country make some progress and we got to make some compromises among these political parties because it's a mess, man. He said, yeah, but, you know, it's all one party's fault. It's 100 percent one party's fault. I said, really, you actually believe that? 
He said, well, what are you? I said, I'm, in, I'm independent. He said, no, you're not. You can't be independent. And he, you know, he started arguing with me. And I'm like, I, I, I just seen you on TV for a few years, wanted to say hi. <laughs> I'm not looking for an argument. But you can't. But I said, but there's no way you can believe that this is one sided. There's no way. And people, we've got to stop picking political sides over every issue and be willing to cross over when something violates scripture. Be a, listen, be a Democrat, be a Democrat all you want, be a Democrat all you want, except in matters of scriptural violation and be a Republican all you want, except in matters of scriptural violation. That's what I would encourage you to do, because I'm not telling you to move from one party to another. I'm saying I'm, I'm saying be able to be independent thinking enough and be able to think for yourself enough not to buy into the propaganda of all of the political hotheads that are trying to influence you and control you and manipulate your mind. We have to live above that. Like I just got tired of it. I'm so balanced and I'm so independent in all this stuff. And I'm I'm I'm, I'm very cautious and ve because I believe in being very gracious with people because they're different places where they come from and different positions that they have. But nobody can possibly think that it's OK to kill a baby that is a viable living thing inside of a mother's womb at nine months old. I'm sorry. Nobody can believe that. And when somebody and nobody can believe nobody can believe somebody that claims, oh, I don't know how that picture of the Ku Klux Klan got in my yearbook. I don't know how that got in there. Yeah, I dressed up like, you know, I put black paint on my face once, but I it, not there like you can't. We can't buy into this stuff, no matter who takes a position, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat. You can't look, you don't agree with Trump. Great. Don't agree with him. But that doesn't make him evil. Barack Obama, you didn't agree with him. Some of you didn't agree with him. That didn't make him evil. Well, these are Americans. They're not pastors. <laughs> They're politicians. We're expecting them to be pastors. And by the way, with regarding pastors, pastors aren't even pastors. Pastors are just people that are trying to help as many people get to heaven, as many people grow in Christ as they can. So I'm going to start my teaching now. <laughs> Anybody that wants to leave over anything that I said can go. But it's not because I'm picking in a political party. There's a lot. I, I can't stand some of the Republican attitudes. I can't stand some of the Democrats attitudes. And that's why we have to be independent thinkers. You need to learn how to be an independent thinker. And your thinking needs to be Bible based, not politically based. And, I, and, and look, I've read I've read some of your posts and some of it is like so much one sided and others so much the other side. But you're all welcome here. You're all welcome here. This is all inclusive church. Hmm, I didn't hear a lot of amens there. Look, I told you this before and I'll tell you it again. When Barack Obama was president, I said, guys, pray for him. Pray for our leaders. First Timothy chapter first Timothy says. So now Donald Trump's our president. Pray for him. Who's going to be president next? We don't know. Whoever it is, I'm going to tell you the same thing. Pray for him or her. Or it. Because now animals are just as popular and just as loved as people these days. I saw somebody literally I was traveling the other day and I literally saw somebody with a what do they call the emotional? Um, what is it? Emotional help animals? N not a service dog, but it's like emotional support, right? <laughs> emotional support animal. I swear I saw this this person with an emotional support pig. <laughs> I li I don't know if you've seen this before, but this person had this pig on a leash. Like I freaked out. I also got pretty hungry right then and thought this would make a lot of this would make a lot of bacon. I could really make this person mad talking about breakfast right now. You can make bacon, you can make ham, you can make sausage, you can get just about anything out of that pig. The ribs on that pig were so good and tempting to me. 
You know, I consider pigs an emotional. Well, I, I consider pigs an uh, emotional um, support animal, too. Every time I have a rib, I am emotionally supported. I feel better about myself. Now, I know this is going <laughs> to. I know this is going to offend some people, but we got to be able to have some fun in church. Why? Why not laugh in here rather than when you walk out, laugh at me like, oh, can you believe that, Pastor? I can't believe that. <laughs> what a joke. Let's at least laugh in the house, not just out of the house and not just in the outhouse. But anyway, here, here's the point. Um, uh, a pastor, he's not a friend of mine. I didn't know him. I'm sure he would have been a friend of mine if I would have known him. But just uh, four days ago, uh, killed himself. He was a pastor of a church in California, um, several thousand people, and he he took his own life. And then I read about how fifteen hundred pastors every month are leaving the ministry, fifteen hundred a month, seven thousand churches a month close or something to that effect. It's out, it's enormous, the amount of, um, of of pressure and stress that comes upon people who are trying to help others. And it really saddened me to hear about another pastor killing himself, another pastor taking his life. And then we hear about pastors that get get caught up in, you know, in in uh, the mistreatment of others. We get we hear of pastors even in our own city, in our own community that um, have that have had some some trouble with their personal relationships. Uh, some that have crossed the line sexually, some that have crossed the line in their emotions, some that have crossed the line in the way they've treated people. And I'm sure that I've crossed the line in some ways. And I hope that if I ever cross a line that crosses you, I hope you'll forgive me because you have darn near crossed the line with me several times and I've forgiven you every single time. <laughs> But um, not looking to cross any lines. But what we don't want to do is cross people out. You know, we don't want to give up on people. We are living in an emotionally sick world and um, the the pain and the tragedies and the suffering that goes on in our world and the and the the evil that goes on in the world happens because of emotionally sick people. So when you see when you hear about somebody that could kill the, this group of people or somebody that could do this harm or somebody that could commit this crime and you say, wow, that is so sick. That is so not sick like we use nowadays where sick is really great. Wow, that's sick, man. But now I'm talking about we usually ascribe to somebody that person was truly sick. That person is mentally sick. That how could somebody do something so sick, so gross? And that is exactly the right description. They are sick. That's no excuse for their behavior. But we got to get to the root of what is going on that is causing people to do the heinous things and believe the heinous things that they believe. We have to get to the root of what causes a person to wear a Ku Klux Klan outfit, what causes a person to 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 take an innocent life, what causes a person to be a racist, uh, what causes a person to to be a sexist and to think that they're superior to women, what causes a person to to think that they're better than somebody else, what causes a person to uh, treat people with disdain or treat people as less than important than themselves. What causes a person to hurt themselves? What causes 800,000 suicides every year in our world? That's one every 40 seconds. What causes three? What causes a 300, uh, 300 heroin overdoses in America per week in this nation, not including fentanyl, and the other opioids that people are using and overdosing on some intentionally, some deliberately, some accidentally because it's a bad patch or it's a bad batch of, of drug. And we are killing ourselves because we are trying to numb our pain. We are killing ourselves because of soul sickness. And today I'm going to talk to you. I know I've already been talking to you and some people you like what I'm saying and some people it might be challenging, but we're a church and we're going to talk about real things and we're going to talk about the stuff not from a political point of view. I hate that. I hate when preachers stand for one political party. I really do. But I love when preachers stand for truth and for life and for godliness and for the Bible and for humility and for the grace of God. I don't like it. I don't like politicians 
that are politicians. I like politicians that are trying to make the country better. I like politicians that are trying to make people's lives better. I know that there's different opinions of what will do that and what will accomplish that. But one thing will not accomplish that. And that's pride and that's stubbornness. And that's people that are just dug into their political position rather than open minded to the word of God. I think every politician needs a pastor speaking into their life. I think every politician needs to have somebody giving them the word of God, teaching them the Bible. Here's what the Bible says. Here's what the Bible says about that. What do you think? What do you think I should do about that? Stop worrying about getting elected again and stop, stop worrying about people's votes and start worrying about what's going to help people because God's smarter than you. It's probably. You know, we have you know, we have we have a, a TV show uh, here and um, it's called The Power to Change Today. And, you know, there are certain there are certain Sundays that make the cut. You know what that means? Make the cut. It made the cut. That means it made it past the church service onto television. This is probably not going to be one of them. <laughs> Seven steps to emotional healing and health, seven steps to emotional healing and health. Now, I want you to see something here in John, chapter 15, verse uh, verse seven, John, chapter 15, verse seven. Jesus says something very powerful. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. You shall ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Now, notice the secret here or the 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 answer here. The solution here is, first of all, Jesus is not saying there's anything wrong with having desire. So he's actually saying desire is good. He said, because you will ask what you desire and it will be done for you. But notice the condition in which your desire will be done for you. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it will be done for you. Now here, our desires are completely controlled and our desires are completely influenced by what's abiding in us. He said, if my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it will be done for you. Now, listen, if God's words are not abiding in you, your desires are going to be perverted. Your desires are going to be twisted. This is the cause of every crime and every bad decision that a human being ever makes is that they have wrong desires and wrong desires is not because a person is an evil person. In most cases, wrong desires is because of what is abiding in you. Look, he's, he's not saying he's, he's showing us a process here. If you abide in me, that's being born again. Now you're in Christ being born again. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it will be done for you. So your desires will be God blessed desires when you, his words abide in you. What's abiding in you right now? Sometimes anger is abiding in us. Sometimes anxiety is abiding in us. Sometimes fear is abiding in us. Sometimes negativity is abiding in us. Sometimes hatred is abiding in us. Sometimes uh, 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 a sense of inferiority is abiding in us. What's abiding in you is what determines what your desires are. And that's why people have perverted, twisted, lustful desires, because that word, one of the definitions for the word lust is the condition of a diseased soul, the condition of a diseased soul. So twisted or wrong lust, wrong desires, which we call lust, because lust really is the word desire. But when it's when it's when it's um, when it's lust that is contrary to God, what God desires, then it is it is the desires that emerge from the diseased condition of the soul, the diseased condition of the soul. We want soul health. We want soul healing because as a man thinks, so is he. And when the soul prospers, your whole life prospers, the Bible says, right? In third John, verse two, he says, beloved, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers or in proportion to your soul's prosperity. But here he talks about desire and he says, if my words abide in you. So the question is, what's abiding in you? 
is fear abiding in you, then your desire is going to be twisted and you're going to you're going to try to obtain your desire in some other way than it being granted to you or it being done for you. So you have to do it for yourself when you have a perverted or twisted desire. But when his words are abiding in you, it causes your desires to be the overflow of God's promises and the overflow of God's word. And you end up desiring what God desires. And when you ask for that, it'll be done for you. But when you're what when what's in your what, what's abiding in you is corrupt, when it's abiding in you is wrong thinking, when what's abiding in you is wrong, is emotions that are uncontained and uncontrolled and unchecked with the word of God, then you have twisted, perverted desires and you will and God will not do those for you. Those desires will not be done for you. So you will go and try to do them for yourself at the harm and expense of others and at the harm and expense of your own future. Does any of this make sense to anybody here today? So what we need to do is we need to focus on what's abiding in us. We need to make sure God's words are abiding in us. How does that how, how does that mean? What does that mean? Well, the I think the I think the NIV says if my words remain in you, if 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 you remain in me and my words remain in you, you shall ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So there's something about remaining. God's words need to remain in you. And the only way for God's words to remain in you is for you to continue to hear them. It's for you to continue to listen. It's for you to continue to plant God's word in your heart because the soul is very powerful. Remember, the soul is the it's the mind to think, the heart to feel and the will to decide. That's what the soul is. And I'm talking to you about soul sickness and soul health today. The soul is the mind to think. It's the heart to feel and it's the will to decide or the will to choose. So when your mind is thinking God's word, your heart is filled with God's word, then your choices will be filled with God's wisdom. Did you hear what I just said? When your mind is filled with God's word, your heart is filled with God's way of feeling and thinking and looking at things, then your choices will be filled with God's wisdom because your will or choice is the overflow of what you think and what you feel. OK, so that's why we have to get to the root of what we think and what we feel. So there's something called soul sickness that we need to be healed from if we're going to experience the life that God created for us. So when I hear of pastors and preachers taking their own lives, when I hear of Christians taking their own lives, when I hear of all the overdose, all of the addictions, let me tell you something about this, uh, particularly that most addictions are coping mechanisms to try to cover the soul sickness, but can't heal it. Like I said, 300 people a week die of heroin overdoses in America alone. If you add up the fentanyl, all the other opioids and all the alcohol related deaths, it's astronomical. According to the World Health Organization, once again, 800,000 people commit suicide every year. One person every 40 seconds. The suicide rate has increased. Listen to this. The suicide rate in America has increased or the world. I'm not sure if this is the world or just America, but it's increased 33 percent between 1999 and 2017. It's increased 33 percent between 1999 and 2017. People's souls are suffering in silence and it's time to be healed. People's souls are suffering in silence and it's time to be healed. What is abiding in you? If there's a hole in your soul, there will be holes everywhere else. What's robbing us of our success, what's robbing us of our God given desires and dreams is what's abiding in us. Is there hate? Is there bitterness? Is there fear? Is there selfishness? Is there anxiety? This is called soul sickness, soul sickness. I've got to explain something to you about soul sickness for a moment, because there was a medical doctor who was running a family practice and she was finding so many people with vague symptoms and she didn't understand what the problem was. So she studied it and she began to, you know, to 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 collect this data over all the people that were coming. So she came to this conclusion that she encountered people many times a day, patients in the, her family practice, 
patients, which she referred to as soul sickness, which I've also referred to because soul sickness is a diagnosis that you won't find described in medical textbooks. You won't find soul sickness described in medical textbooks. But she she kept she kept seeing that they had they would they had unexplained symptoms such as body pain, dizziness, fatigue, headaches, insomnia. They were diagnosed as having conditions such as chronic fatigue syndrome, chronic Lyme disease, uh, chronic pain syndrome, fibromyalgia, uh, migraine headaches, multiple chemical sensitivity syndrome or any host of emerging new diagnoses. She found that the origin of soul sickness, the origin, the root of soul sickness is a person's inability to deal with internal or external stress. Our inability to deal with internal or external stress causes soul sickness. The internal stress could be born of emotional, physical or sexual abuse. The external stress may arise from insufficient coping skills for dealing with the problems and the suffering that life brings everyone to various degrees that a person no longer feels they are competent to live productive lives and to meet the expectations of people close to them. That's soul sickness. They've come to a place where they the internal stress, they might have they might have had emotional abuse, physical abuse or sexual abuse. It's created emotional internal stress and soul sickness is the result of not being able to deal with internal or external stress. I need to say something to you is very important that you get a hold of this, that mental illness, depression, addiction, alcoholism, sexual crisis, identity crisis, suicidal thoughts. These are not character flaws in a person's life. They are illnesses. They are diseases. Listen to me. These are not character flaws. Well, you just have a character flaw. You just need to work on your character and you won't be an alcoholic. You just need to work on your character and you won't do drugs. You just need to know these are illnesses and these are sicknesses. But here's the thing. It's one thing if I were to say to you, these are illnesses and sicknesses and you'll have to deal with them and you'll just have to stay sick and ill the rest of your life. But Jesus said something different about that in Matthew, chapter four, verse twenty three. And I need you to see this. Matthew, chapter 40, uh, chapter four, verse twenty three. I want you to see this in the New American Standard Bible. If you can notice this, Matthew four, twenty three. And Jesus was going through all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So we know he was teaching and we know he was preaching. But the third thing we sometimes overlook and forget what he was doing, and that was healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. Now, if mental illness and addictions and alcoholism and uh, and suicidal feelings and, de and and depression and anxiety, if these are just character flaws, then we could just learn some character uh, skills and learn how to have better behavior and better skills and then it would go away. But people people learn those things and it doesn't go away. Why? Because they're illnesses and their sicknesses and they're rooted in something and they're rooted in a broken soul uh, that does not know how to deal with internal or external stress. And as a result, they are coping mechanisms to deal with this stress. Are you still with me? But Jesus heals every kind. Look at what he says. He healed every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. That means physical sickness. That means emotional sickness. That means mental sickness. That means addiction sickness. Jesus is the healer. There is hope in Jesus. And soul sickness is where every one of these things emerge from. And other things, being a workaholic flows from soul sickness. Being angry at others flows from soul sickness. Mistreating people, treating people like dirt, that comes from soul sickness. Feeling loneliness comes from soul sickness. Feeling hopeless comes from soul sickness. Listen, we're going to be healed in our souls today. At least we're going to start being healed in our souls because listen, this is soul sickness is characterized by feelings of hopelessness and helplessness and you feel incompetent for what you're up against. It involves vague, unexplainable symptoms and soul sickness can be healed. And it starts here. 
It starts with understanding the value of life and the value of your soul. Jesus said in Mark's Mark 8, 36, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? And we've always thought many Christians have thought, well, that scripture means, you know, uh, hey, why gather things? Because and then you're going to lose your soul. If you if you gain the whole world, you will lose your soul. Well, look, you could have millions and billions of dollars and not lose your soul. And you could be broke. But have lost your soul and going to hell. He's not saying it's wrong to have things. What he's saying is he's making a comparison. He's saying even if you could gain the whole world, that is that does not compare. The value of gaining the whole world is not equal to the value of your soul. The value of your soul is so much greater than gaining the whole world. Don't you see there are many people that don't have anything and they're going to hell. And then there are many people that have a lot of things and they're saved. And then there are people that have a lot of things and they're not saved. It's not about whether you have things or whether you don't have things. It's about value, valuing your soul. A person who values their soul will not treat themselves in a way that is constantly being abused or beaten or taken advantage of. A person who values their soul will not lower their worth. They will not lower their worth. They will they will value their worth. They will understand their worth. Self worth produces net worth. It affects every area of your life when you can value who you are. That's where you will find healing in your soul. Your soul's health starts and your soul recovering from soul sickness starts with valuing your soul the way Jesus valued it. You know how much he valued it? He valued your soul so much that silver and gold, he did not buy you with silver or gold or things that are perishable, but he bought you with the precious blood of the lamb. That's how valuable you are to God. You're so valuable to God that he didn't purchase you with a car. He didn't purchase you and say, ah, could I give you some money, devil? No, he didn't say, oh, I'll purchase their soul with what I think their soul is worth, maybe 50 bucks, 100 bucks, 1000 bucks. How about a few animals? No, no animal could could value. No animal could be offered. You know, animals are very valuable to God. God created them, but he didn't create animals in his image. He created you and me in his image. He created human beings in his image. It's sad when people value the life of an animal more than they value a life of human beings. And that that's usually because they've been hurt so bad by humans. But you know what? If you've been bit by a dog, you don't value dogs very much anymore. <laughs> This is why people get this is why people value animals sometimes more than more than more than humans is because humans have hurt them. And so they go to they they're drawn to the to the comfort of an animal that hasn't hurt them. But you just have an animal hurt you once and you'll be running back to church. <laughs> you'll be like, I need some people. I need some <laughs> I need some people in my life that won't hit, hurt me like the like the animals did. Uh, this will sink in. This will make sense to you if you really think about it. OK, now. Let me show you something. Psalm 143, I got to tie this together because Satan's goal is to get you to settle in silence and to suffer in silence. And look, people make bad decisions. And let me tell you something about people that choose lifestyles that are unbiblical or people that make decisions, even people that have had abortions, even people that have gone into um, uh, homosexuality or some other lifestyle that we find in Scripture, contra it contradicts Scripture. So. So what do we do about that? What do we say to people like that? How do we treat people like that? Because what if your child told you I'm transgender or I feel like I'm transgender. How do you treat them? How do we treat a church member? How do we treat somebody that comes off the street and says, I'm you know, I'm openly gay. I'm openly. Do we kick them out of the church? No, here's what we do. We don't condone people's choices. Instead, we cultivate people's worth. Listen to me. We don't condone people's choices. We cultivate people's worth. So when you come to this church, 
I'm not here to condone your choice. You have the freedom to choose whatever you want to choose, whether you think that's how you're born or whether you think that's a choice. It's irrelevant to me because I'm not here to condone or to judge your choices. I'm here to cultivate your worth, because if I can cultivate your worth and I mean like truly cultivate it and truly get you to see how valuable you are, how God ascribes value to you, how God thinks you're worth much, valued much, loved much, approved much, accepted much. We cultivate worth. We cultivate worth. We cultivate worth. And the person who has a cultivated sense of worth will make biblical choices. I'm telling you, folks, there are a lot of people that make biblical choices, but they have low self-worth. Those are choices they make out of fear. They fear so they make the right choice. And God doesn't want you to make the right choice out of fear. He doesn't want you to make the wrong choice, but he doesn't. But God is not looking at your life based on the choices that you make. He's looking at your life based on the value that you place upon yourself, the worth that you place upon yourself, because we need to get our sense of worth from how God views us, not from our color, not from our money uh, or lack of, not from our size, not from our physical appearance, not from our not from whether we're tall or short or skinny or fat or anything in between. Our value and our worth should come from the one who paid for us with his own blood. And when we cultivate that sense of worth, you're a human being. It doesn't matter what color you are. You're a human being. It doesn't matter to me what political party you're from. You're a human being. It doesn't matter how old or young you are. You're a human being. It doesn't matter to me if you're struggling with your gender and struggling with your identity. My job is not to tell you who you are in your physical sense. My job is to tell you who you are in Christ and show you how valuable you are, how much worth you have, and then let your worth, let your cultivated worth determine your choices. Does this make sense to anybody? It's, let's look at the time. Is the game started yet? OK, here we go. Let me finish this. I got to catch you up to last week's service or to last service to nine, nine o'clock service. All right, let me finish my sentences. Psalm 143. <laughs> Psalm 143. I know what it's like to suffer in silence, to silently suffer. You don't dream big anymore. You don't have creative thoughts. You can't think straight. You're overwhelmed by anxiety. You're silenced from having a voice in the earth. That's a silent mind. It's a depressed mind. Psalm 94, verse 17 says in the New Living Translation, I would soon have settled in the silence of the grave. I would soon have settled in the silence of the grave. People that are so their soul is sick. They feel death is imminent. When a person's soul is sick, they want to die. When a person's soul is sick, Psalm 94, verse 17 in the New Living Translation says, I would soon have settled in the silence of the grave. Verse 19 says, when my anxious thoughts, when my anxiety multiplies within me, only your consolation, only your consolation, only your comforts give me renewed hope and cheer. See, only the Holy Spirit can comfort you. I can't even comfort you, but the Holy Spirit can. The best friend in the world can't comfort you. They can try and they should. But the Holy Spirit, your comfort gives me renewed hope and cheer. I want to encourage you to get acquainted with the Holy Spirit. Read about the Holy Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit to baptize you. Learn the beautiful gift. Learn to to believe in the biblical, beautiful gift of tongues. It's a beautiful gift. If you went to a church before this one where they were like, hush, hush, you can speak in tongues at home, but oh, no, don't 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 share that with anybody else. We don't want too many tongue talkers here. I'm glad you don't go there anymore, not because I'm against any churches, but Jesus said. These signs will follow those who believe in my name. They'll speak with new tongues. It's because tongues is the language of the Holy Spirit. So is love. Love is the number one language of the Holy Spirit. But tongues is one of the languages of the Holy Spirit. It's a beautiful gift. It's a beautiful gift. It's not something God will force down your throat. But it's a gift to 
be able to speak mysteries to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2 says. It speaks mysteries to God. You're exalting God. 1 Corinthians 14, verse I think 18 says, you're giving thanks well when you speak in tongues. I, I want to give thanks well. I do a pretty good job in English thanking God, but I, I, do, I do even a better job thanking God when I'm speaking in tongues. That's what the Bible says. Now you can look up those verses later. You can look them up now. I don't care. But we need the Holy Spirit. Satan's goal is to get you to suffer in silence. Stop dreaming. Stop prophesying. Stop speaking faith. Stop believing God for big things. Listen, look, he goes on to say, and if you go back to Psalm 143, because everyone knows what it's like to feel lonely. Everyone knows what it's like to feel afraid. Everyone knows what it's like to go through dark times. Look at Psalm 143, verse three. He says, the enemy pursues me. He crushes me to the ground. He makes me dwell in the darkness like those long dead. This is what life is like sometimes. This is what it's like to suffer in silence. The enemy pursues me. The enemy crushes me. The enemy makes me dwell in darkness. The enemy, the devil is an enemy. He wants you to feel dead so that you can catch up by killing yourself. He wants you to feel darkness. He wants you to feel your crush. He wants you to feel pursued. He wants you to feel opposed. He wants you to feel oppressed. He tries to paint a hopeless, dark picture of your life so you become discouraged and lonely and depressed. Maybe you feel like you're in that kind of place right now. Well, you came to the right place because the light because the rise shine, the light has come and the glory of God is rising upon you today. How do we break through? How do we break through this this place of darkness? Psalm 119 verse 30 says the entrance of his word brings light as we flood the light of God's word. Listen to me as we flood the light of God's word into our lives, then you will experience the darkness fleeing, loneliness fleeing, depression fleeing. Psalm 119 verse 30 says the entrance of his word brings light. When you're going through a time of darkness, the only solution is light and the entrance of God's word into your heart brings light. God's word coming into your life brings light. God's word is bringing light to your life right now. As the word of God is being preached, there is light coming to you, not light to expose something bad in your life, but light to drive out the darkness, light to drive out the fear, light to be like a laser of light that drives out the sickness and disease, that drives out the soul sickness, that drives out the loneliness, that drives out the anxiety, that drives out the worry. But rise, shine, for your light has come. And that's how the glory of the Lord rises upon you. It is the light of God's word entering into your life. It gives understanding and it gives light and it brings change and it brings clarity and it brings warmth. You think about what light brings. It brings warmth. Light brings direction. You can't go around in the dark. You're going to bump into things all the time. But when there's light, you can get anywhere you need to go. Light is beautiful. Light is warm. Light is healing. Light is loving. Light is God and God is light. And when the entrance of his word comes in, then light comes and darkness flees. You know what? If I'm if I'm going through a time of darkness, I can pray against that darkness. It's not going anywhere. I can fast against that darkness. It's not going anywhere. I can march around that darkness seven times and that darkness is not going to leave. But you know what? If I will just switch the light on, which is as effortless as you can get, you just switch the light on and the darkness flees. That's why he says the entrance of his word brings light. Go back to Psalm 143. Let me wrap this up. Seven steps <laughs> to emotional healing and health in five minutes. Ready? Here we go. What does he do when the enemy is pursuing him? Verse four. Look at what he says. My spirit grows faint within me. My heart is dismayed. What is the solution? Verse five. Verse number one is found in verse five. I will remember the days of long ago. I will meditate on all thy works. So the first step to emotional health and healing is to remember what God has done and to meditate on what he has done, to remember what he's done and meditate on what he's done. Memory and meditation. Remember and meditate. Remember and meditate. You would be surprised if you would realize 
How much of your emotions every day of your life are the result of what you're meditating on? How much your your emotions are the byproduct and the result of what you're remembering? Your memory is powerful. And if you remember the hurt and if you remember the pain and if you remember what people have done to you, then you will feel sad. You will feel bitter. You will feel angry. But if you will remember what God has done, remember his works of long ago. Remember when he healed you. Remember when he healed your kid. Remember when he got you out of that accident. Remember when he got you out of that ticket. Remember when he got you out of that bar. Remember when he got you out of that sickness. Remember when he got you out of that fear. Remember when he got you out of that disease. Remember when he got you out of that bad relationship. Remember, 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 and healing will flow like a river. Number two, I will remember. Number one, I will remember remembering what God has done. Number two, I will spread out my hands to you. In verse six, I will spread out my hands to you. What does this speak of? Okay, let me give it to you real quick. I will spread out my hands to you. Oh, man, when you spread out your hands, you're welcoming God's embrace. You're spreading out your hands for a hug. I will spread out my hands to you to embrace God, to embrace his love. I'm spreading out my hands to worship God and adore him. And I'm spreading out my hands to receive what God has for me. I'm spreading out my hands. Hear hear this now. I'm spreading out my hands to embrace the Lord's embrace. I'm spreading out my hands to worship and adore him. I'm spreading out my hands to receive all that he has for me. I will spread out my hands. This will heal you. You spread out your hands in this way, it'll heal you. Number three, verse seven says, answer me speedily. Answer me quickly, Lord. What does this mean? How do we how do we apply this in our lives? We must expect answers from God. We must expect from God. Hopelessness is a lack of expectation. The reason we feel hopeless is because we lack expectation. The thing that will give you hope is when you expect God to answer. You expect God to come through. Don't be moved by what you see or what you feel. We walk by faith and not by sight. I will experience God's answer. I'm expecting God to answer. He says, answer me quickly, Lord. Expect an answer quickly. Expect an answer today. If it doesn't come today, when you wake up tomorrow, expect it tomorrow. If it doesn't come tomorrow morning, expect it in the afternoon. If it doesn't come in the afternoon, expect it in the evening. If it doesn't come in the evening, expect it while you're sleeping. If it doesn't come while you're sleeping, expect it when you wake up. If it doesn't come when you wake up, expect it at lunchtime. If it doesn't come at lunchtime, expect it in the mailbox. If it doesn't come in the mailbox, expect it from Amazon. If it doesn't come from Amazon, expect it from UPS. If it doesn't come from UPS, expect it from USPS. If it doesn't come from USPS, expect it from, 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 from DHL. If it doesn't come from DHL, tell. Expect, 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 expect. This is how you heal your soul. Expect from God, not from people. He doesn't say answer me quickly, husband. He doesn't say answer me quickly, wife. He doesn't say answer me quickly, church. He says answer me quickly, Lord. He doesn't say answer me quickly, government. He doesn't say answer me quickly, politics. He doesn't say answer me quickly, senator. He doesn't say answer me quickly, president. He says answer me quickly, Lord. Woo, you start expecting from God and you'll be healed. Because the only thing makes our soul sick One of the things that makes our soul sick is when people let us down or we let ourselves down. It doesn't say he doesn't even say answer me quickly, self. He says, answer me quickly, Lord. Number four, let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love. Oh, you need to wake up every day meditating on God's love. Find a scripture on the love of God. I wrote this thing a few years ago called I will greet this day with God's love in my heart. Uh, Maybe I'll read it to you next week if you show up. (laughs) We're out of time, man. I got it takes me five hours to prepare for the Super Bowl. Um, (laughs) Notice what he says. Let the morning bring me word of what I've done wrong. No of where I failed. No, let me let the morning bring me word of all that I have to do and all that I don't have. No, let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love. 
Every morning needs to start with the love of God, the love God has for you, the love God has for you. It doesn't even need to start with you loving God. It needs to start with his unloving, with his unfailing love towards you. And you need to hear the word of his unfailing love. It's not a feeling. Sometimes you'll feel it, but it's the word of his unfailing love. That's what gives you hope. That's what heals your soul. That's what gives you a proper expectation. That's what keeps hope alive. That's what not, does not disappoint. The love of God will not disappoint. Hope will not disappoint because of the love of God that has been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. Number five, he says, show me the way that I shall go in verse eight. In other words, ask God for wisdom. Show me the way. Verse eight says, show me the way that I shall go for I to you. I entrust my life. Show me the way I should go for you, for to you I entrust my life. Show me the way. Show me the way. Ask God for wisdom. Ask him to show you the way. You want to be healed? Get your wisdom from God, not from people. Get your wisdom from God, not from your opinion. Get your wisdom from God, not all the experts. There's nothing wrong with learning from people, but we need to get our wisdom from God. Lord, you show me the way that I should go. Everybody's got an opinion of what you should do. Get yours from God. And then number six, teach me to do your will. May your good spirit lead me. We need to welcome and invite the Holy Spirit to lead us and to teach us. Stop being afraid of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> we got to stop that. We got to stop being afraid of the Holy Ghost. We got to stop thinking that preachers that talk about the Holy Ghost are, are too crazy for us too wild for us. Stop being so prideful and invite the Holy Spirit to lead you. If you went to a church where they didn't teach much about the Holy Spirit, I apologize on behalf of the preachers that are afraid that people will leave the church if you talk about tongues and if you talk about the Holy Spirit and if you talk about the baptism of the power of God. I'm sorry, but that's the only way you're going to live victoriously is with the help of the Holy Spirit. No one can do it alone. No one can do it alone. This isn't psychology. This isn't psychology. You can get that without God, but you can't get the Holy Spirit without God. And number seven, I know it's overtime here, but I'm about to kick the field goal and it's going to we're going to win. I'm not hitting the goalpost twice. Um, <laughs> that's a Chicago joke. Uh, Verse 11 says, remember, for your namesake, Lord, preserve my life in your righteousness. Bring me out of trouble. OK, listen to me now. This is the final point. Number seven, the final step to emotional healing and health is embracing the gift of righteousness and use learning to identify with who you are in Christ on the righteousness of God. The opposite of righteousness is shame, guilt, condemnation, self-righteousness, pride. Listen, he says, in your righteousness, bring me out of trouble. Our own righteousness is as filthy rags, the Bible says, but his righteousness, which he gave us as a gift, will bring us out of every bit of trouble. The righteous will prevail. The righteous will get up when they fall. The righteous can pray and have answers prevail. The righteous move mountains. The righteous are bold. The righteous are walking in divine healing. Identify with the gift of righteousness. Fill your mind with who you are in Christ and you will be healed of soul sickness. Let's stand together.